welcome along to the Man in the Mirror podcast. It's Hayden Williams here, and you've come to the right place if you're interested in self-care, self-image, grooming, fragrance, skincare, and all those good things. Each week, I talk to a male guest about their life, about work, and I have a sneak peek on their bathroom shelf and they tell me about some of those hero items, those ones they can't do without in their morning and evening routines. This week, uh, it's another face-to-face episode. I went into the centre of town to meet Andrew Cannon, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ruffians. Now, Ruffians, if you don't know, are sort of high-end barber chain. We do have a discussion, actually, in in the podcast about the sort of terminology around, you know, hair salons, barbers. But anyway, Ruffians has five salons. The first one was in Edinburgh, and there's four in London now, which are in Shoreditch, Covent Garden, Marylebone, where we met. And there's also one in the Liberties Department Store. So, yeah, I had a really interesting conversation with Andrew. So I went along to the Marlborough Salon, got to see the ruffians experience, if you like, and see what it was like in there and the, the kind of treatments they do, the, the different haircuts and um, shaving and, and grooming routines that you can have there. Yeah, really interesting to talk to Andrew and to find out more about how ruffians came to be, the kind of products that they sell, the point of difference... So I really hope you're going to enjoy this episode. It's Andrew Cannon, the co-founder and CEO of Ruffians. I'm Hayden Williams. Let's go. Welcome along to another episode of Man in the Mirror. It's Hayden Williams here. And um, I've taken my microphone and laptop and I'm out on the town once more. This time I'm in um, Marlebone and on Wigmore Street in one of the ruffian stalls. I'm here with Andrew Cannon, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ruffians. Morning, Andrew. Morning. Thanks How are you? Me. Yeah, very good. Nice to be, you know, out and about doing stuff like this. Yeah, well, look, thanks for having me in the um, in the salon this morning. And it's so great to actually see, what, see what's going on and, and seeing customers getting their haircut and getting the ruffians experience. Yeah, so sort of there's a little background. No, no, it's, it's, it's good. I think, uh, you know, listen to the Exactly. Friends. You'll hear authentic hair dryers and authentic barber chats as, yeah. we, as we, we're downstairs in the kind of um, training room. But first of all, I mean, on, on a point of order, how do you feel about the word barbershop? Like, because oh, I can tell you, Ruffians, is, is, there's a really nice aesthetic, lots of sort of reclaimed wood, beautiful Japanese barber chairs, and, and it feels like a sort of elevated experience. Do you, do you consider Ruffians a... A barbershop or a men's salon? Do you mind? Yes. How, how should I describe it? It's a really horrible because we never wanted to be a salon or a barbershop. So, yeah. you know, actually went back to when we named Ruffians and came up with the idea. Well, I just wanted, I wanted to be like, if you go to Starbucks, you know what you're getting. If you go to, you know, Yang Coffee, obviously. If you go to Pret, you're getting a sandwich. I was like, if you go to Ruffians, you're getting, like, a haircut. And that's, we like, but you can't call yourself a haircutters because they're it's, 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 it's slightly too in the middle. Yeah. So we went down the barbershop line because we were like, you know, men's is what we do in the special thing. But like, the idea was eventually, you know, just ruffians. I'm just going to go to ruffians. And everyone yeah. uh, associates that with like a good quality men's haircut. But, you know, in this modern era as well, it is a bit more fluid than that. You know, it's yeah. sort of, uh, you know, there's a lot of girls who come in as well and get their haircut too because we basically cut styles that are more masculine. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, you know, in this, you know, more gender fluid world. Like, there's loads of girls that come in as well and enjoy the experience. And also, they like the environment as well because you try and ch- like, it's not a traditional barbershop, but sort of, for want of a better word, like clutter uh, along all the walls and stuff like yeah. that and uh, memorabilia. It's, uh, but it's not like your shiny, peach smelling salon either. So no. It's, it's an identity, I suppose, and experience. It's you. really interesting. You are a bit yeah. different. Yeah. That, that there's an in- inclusivity to it and that it's kind of um, everyone is welcome, which is, which yeah. is great. So I think we're clear then, we, it, rather than it being, you know, a barbershop or a hair salon, it, it, it's just ruffians. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> yeah. and, and Finally we get that. Yeah. There we go, yeah. And so ruffians was set up about 10 years ago now. 10 years, yeah. So we launched in 2012, yeah, up in Edinburgh, the first outpost, as we now call it, which is yeah. very obsessive for them. They're like, no, we're not an outpost. We're, <laughs> we're, we're the, the heart of things. We're the original of the best, yeah. <laughs> so up in Edinburgh, and then progressively we launched uh, four more shops down here in London. So we've got, um, you know, Covent Garden was next, then the, here we are in Marlborough on Wigmore Street, then Shoreditch, and then we were always looking for a while somewhere in Soho, and we're in Liberty, okay. lovely, which is, you know, a phenomenal place to be and helps... You know, elevate who we are as well, which is nice. Absolutely, and the, yeah, and that's the one that I've I've been to and had a really nice experience there. And actually, we have a former 
guest on the podcast, uh, Robin James, the man for himself mm. to thank because he, he connected Andrew and myself. So that was, uh, that was really kind of him. And I know he's a big fan yeah, yeah. Of, of ruffians and Scottish brethren yeah yes exactly. and he's moved, moved he's back to Edinburgh so yeah now he's uh, we're like if you're up here you cannot go anywhere else we're trying to he comes in there so he's a, been super you know, advocate and supporter of us and yeah. loads of other people you know in that industry who just you know it's actually really inclusive and sort of supportive you know the men's grooming world or, or even not just pushing out like, into men's fashion and stuff as well I think there aren't as many you know the female world is just dominates so when you find that sort of niche you're having a uh, a few guys to support you is is very nice. Yeah, and I suppose it's interesting to to think about thinking about setting up a a men's salon, a, a barber shop. You know, what what do you think is different about ruffians? Because we're all familiar with the, the the barber shop on the high street, and you know, it's it's a certain price point, and you know what you're going to get. What did you want to do that was was different? Because obviously, you've built out ruffians now, as you say, into to five branches. Where's where's the point of difference? Do you think, Andrew? You know, I think. It, it goes back to the beginning moment when you're sort of saying up and the idea of ruffians was to create an environment that is relaxing and confidence building for for guys having their hair cut and it's mm. it is you know the word is used a lot nowadays but anxiety but there is a, a relatively large amount of anxiety around getting your hair cut like we have guys who come in who are ceos or you know brain surgeons whatever like really high pressure things but mm. then they come in and they just have no control about how they get their hair cut and i know it sounds really silly but it means a lot to them and i was thought well you know where is that where can they go they can go 10 years ago you, the modern barbershop revolution that we're part of and you know we are very proud to be in it but it hadn't really happened for us and we mm. sort of we'd like to think of some of the forefathers of that yeah so you had your cheap barbershop where you know it wasn't clean uh it wasn't well serviced and you didn't necessarily get a great haircut at the end of it uh, and you then you had your salons so your totally guys and it was mainly you know, there were independent salons but mainly like the chains and stuff like that so we were like well we don't really want to be in a tony guy environment and mm. they so you know one in ten haircuts there is probably a man's haircut so those guys aren't those stylists aren't actually as no. good at cutting hair as you might think. Uh, men, sorry, men's hair, they're great hairstylists, don't get me wrong, but they're not as practiced and trained and they don't have the familiarity with it. So I was like, why isn't there this environment that you can go into that's enjoyable, that is, has a nice sort of um, buzz and energy to it? And that's where it came around. So in terms of how do you create something that they feel that relaxation and they can just get in there and, and sort of describe what they want, but also be a lot of it is the consultation like help them explain what they want because you know there's nothing worse than sitting down in a chair and the person sort of chucks on your gown and says right what do you want and yeah you're like, oh, sometimes you need a bit of help yeah. so we're sort of a bit like you know the first question should be like if we haven't had cut the hair before and we know that because of our repos system we'll be like oh you're a new client welcome thanks for coming and joining us yeah we'll chat a little bit put them at ease you know and then be like right so when was your last haircut which is a great starting thing because mm. they can't get that question wrong yeah. They can be like, yay, like, I, can, I can answer that. So they're like, right, I had it six weeks ago. And then immediately, you know, whoever's cutting your hair can actually just uh, be like, okay, well, this is six weeks of growth and we know that on average it's like a centimetre a month or whatever. Then you'd be like, right, this is what it must look like. Wow, it's a bit heavy on this side. Mm. Do you wish they'd taken that a bit shorter? And they'd be like, yeah or no. And they, they, they actually, you can see them physically get excited about the fact that, like, yeah. wow, this is going to work for me. And then, you know, during the actual haircut, they can relax and enjoy it. And it's all about that and like building relationships. And we got you training you could do with hairdressers. You just keep going and you get better and better and better. But it mainly it's repetition, like riding a bike. Like mm -hmm. you're gonna make a few mistakes along the way. Our guys are experienced and they do that. But you can't teach them how to converse. You can't teach them how to build yeah. the emotion and to chat and, and pick up on you know social and visual hues of someone and whether they're anxious or whether they're looking super relaxed or what, even just observe, like observing what clothes they're wearing. So they're halfway through echo, they're like, oh my God, I love your... Uh, you know, your Nikes or whatever they're wearing. Mm. And that person, again, feels good about themselves, they feel noticed, but it's actually genuinely because our guys care about that sort of thing and they, yeah. they've chosen to be in this industry and we're at the top end of it. So, like, when people apply for jobs with us, you know, they're, they're nervous because they're like, this is where I want to get to. So yeah. it's sort of, that, that's the environment we've been trying to create. And, like, I think, you know, if you look at retail, like, there was a, a strong surge of, like, the experience. If you're going to go to retailers and buy, let's say, fashion, like, clothes, then the design and layout of the store is very important. And I guess that didn't happen in my industry as well. So we take a lot of you know, pride in how our stores look and yeah. the materials we use, because I think someone's sitting there you know, 45 minutes, they can just sit back, lean back and they're all in, and they're taking you in. Yeah. Uh, they're noticing the little dirty bits and the clean bits and the effort, the little tweaks of things we've done. So 
I think it's it's that wasn't happening ten years ago. Yeah. It probably sounds a bit like common sense now. It's like, oh, well, that's just normal. But like, it's we've had to work hard to, you know, be with that and like yeah. elevate above it. And the way you elevate is through training your team and making them happy. And yeah. Like, we've got the best team in Britain, and definitely, which means you know, London is the hub of hairdressing in the world. So we're probably the best hairdresser in the world. Yeah. There you go. Hey, you heard it here. That's all I'm like. But you're absolutely that. right. I mean, I think we go back to our hairdressers as much for you know the experience and the people that we the barber that we connect with or that, that's as as important i would say as yeah. the, the haircut it's, it's probably it's, more important now than it ever has been just yeah. because of lots of talk around mental health and stuff like that there's a lot yeah. of there's a lot of movements for that within the hairdressing industry to go both ways because you know there's you, you don't go to your barber necessarily for mental health advice mm. um but you sort of passively get it like you accidentally ask it you and you're, yeah. you're offloading right and so there's, that's quite a burden on our individuals. Cause yeah. They've got, you know, 10 to 12 people telling them a 40... Just letting 40, it all out. 40-minute story. <laughs> yeah. You know, of like their divorce or their work stress or, yeah. or, you know, their COVID anxiety, whatever it might have been. And so, yeah, we do now, yeah, it would educating our guys to be like how to deal with this, like for themselves. Really? Compartmentalise. Yeah. Really, like, don't just store that away and get yourself in a, in a tiz. Like, yeah, you need to share that, but also how to help that person. Oh, we're, we're not healthcare professionals, so we'll be like, look, you know, if you want to, you know, you can go and chat to these other people. Like, because mm. like, like, there's the odd time that happens, but mainly people have it in a relatively jovial, fun way. So those are outlying cases, but you know, you have to really take, pay attention to it now. Yeah. I think people want it and they want a nice sounding board, and some people don't want that at all, and they just want stories and fun, you yeah. know, and you can give them that too, and you know, make it a good laugh so they come back and, you know, my. I always said to the guys, like, the, uh, the sign of success is if when you finish that conversation, that person is like, God, I want to go for a drink with you in the pub now. And like, I just want to be like a friend. Yeah. Because uh, then, and then, you know, often you'll, times you'll say to the team, look, just find out, or they will find out a couple of interesting things about them so that when they uh, leave and come back, you'll be like, oh, how was that? So it might be like, and around nowadays, like, the Six Nations rugby's on, so it's a bit mm. like, oh, how was the rugby game? Isn't it amazing? Like, you know, England dumped Italy or whatever it might be. Yeah. So they come back and, again, the media, they feel warm. They're like, oh, they, you remember that yeah. I was going to do that. It's like, yeah, because it's interesting to me. So, you know, that's it's that relationship building that is just totally, totally key. Totally. And it, and it points to the fact that, you know, even if it's, you know, once every month or a couple of months, whatever it is, that that relationship, if you get to see the same barber, like you say, it's a sounding board. It, it, it does become... It does become a, a sort of valuable relationship, and, yeah. and it's, it's someone, I suppose, that's independent. That you can have a conversation that won't be shared elsewhere. And I, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to be said for that. That's it. I, yeah, it is. It is private and confidential and fun. And I think that you know, there's the, it almost becomes a ritual in a way that is something to be looked forward to. It's like, yeah, oh, I can't wait to go for my next haircut. Whereas most guys, getting your haircut is a chore. It's a lot of my hair has grown. How inconvenient! I'll stop off here and get it. Whereas we say to the guys, look, the customers um, and our friends, we say, look, we want you to book now. Like, when you're leaving, book now. Something to look forward to in four weeks' time or six yeah. weeks' time, whatever it is, they choose. And you know, probably half our customers are like, yeah, let's get that booked in. And then mm. we send them, you know, we've got it all set up so they get sent an email and text reminder so they're aware of it and they can reschedule they need to. But it's just something to get in, in the diary as a sort of a bit of a ritual and excitement. Yeah. No, I, t I totally understand that. And I think, you know, probably even when, when Ruffy is was founded 10 years ago we we weren't using terms like self-care and all that stuff but it's it's just as important for men to take that time and decompress or you know have a beer or a coffee with up, upstairs as they're having their hair cut yeah a, a bit of time for themselves and 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 entrusted to someone that knows what they're doing and it, and it's, it just doesn't feel like every time you have to explain it all again i think that's yeah really, i mean really valuable to me you know health is physical, mental, and social, right? So it's those things that we work a lot on that. And this, we're super lucky because what we do is physical, mental, and social. Well, we just, yeah. we incorporate all bits of health. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of the whole well-being and stuff like that nowadays, but they keep it simple. Like, you just have a nice chat with these people. They walk out looking great, feeling great, and whether that's them going off to a meeting so they can do that, or whether it's just going home to their family. But, you know, hair is a very personal thing and I would totally you know, some people who are super wealthy you know and could easily afford ruffians haircuts every day if they wanted to 
they would never come in because it's like it's not hair isn't their thing or like that physical appearance the element of it doesn't mean something to them and they might spend loads of money on their clothes loads of money on i don't know probably moisturizers whatever mm. but hair is just not a deal whereas there are some people who come in to us and you know it's a, it's a payday thing and they're like call my payday i'm coming in to get my hair cut because yeah. it's the thing is part it's of nice their identity yeah. yeah and it makes them they don't really care what everyone else thinks they walk out feeling really confident yeah and then they tackle whatever else they want to tackle and it's sort of you know when i got into this i didn't, I didn't realize it was quite such a a big deal for yeah, so many so holistic. Yeah, and it's, it's cool. It's sort of... Oh, did, you, did you think... Was having a, a, a line of products always part of the sort of roadmap for ruffians? Did they did they come quite early on in the... Yeah, yeah. When, when the, you set up in, in the, Edinburgh? Yeah, yeah. So the business plan was always barbershop with products, be it not setting up a product brand to then have barbershops alongside it. Mm. You know, and one, because we... we I didn't know what I was doing, you know, effectively, in all honesty. I was just like... So, say, Andrew, you, Andrew, you Andrew's background, you're, you're... I mean, you, you've got experience and you've, you've done some, you know, experience there working in the salon, but you're, you're not a sort of hairdresser yeah, by trade, are you? I'm not a hairdresser by trade, no. So I did marketing and advertising uh, and then the retail sort of operations, I suppose. Right. So it came to it from a, a very different mindset, not in this industry at all either. So none of the... So I wasn't in you know toiletries or beauty and not in hairdressing and it was more the opportunity i was like this is this is a, this chore of getting your haircut needs to change uh, and let's make it fun and enjoyable so mm. that's where it came from so when the business plan was originally written it always had like these are the barber shops and we're going to build our own product range so at the beginning we didn't have the the funds to do that or the know-how so it was a case of right let's go away prove that we can create this barbershop environment atmosphere that everyone can not everyone our customers relate to and enjoy and then work and find out from them let's let's do our product research and find out what's what they want what they don't want so we did that had to create our first range and the first thing we did was two years in i think uh, when we just just were about to launch i think down here in london and we thought well if we could launch london with some products so we had a few of our products uh which were shampoos and styling products which we thought were like you know sort of the most relevant things yeah. to us yeah and then we were still supplementing what we don't have because I mean, it's, you know, there's a reason you walk into the beauty hall at Selfridges and there's a gazillion products. Like everyone wants different things, whether that's yeah. scent, whether yeah. that's function or ingredient or uh, yeah, maybe just packaging, like something that makes them feel right for them. Mm. Uh, so we were like, well, let's do a few things. We did six products and uh, then everything else we substituted with stuff from other brands that we cared about and thought were good. People like Sasha Juan. We actually worked with um, L'Oreal in their Techni Arts side, which is like their sort of catwalky type stuff. Oh, okay. Really high performance. Yeah, yeah. For professional grade. So we worked with them. Um, and that meant also we get access to doing other fun things, uh, trade shows and stuff where we go on stage and do haircuts and stuff for them. Mm. So there's a lot of synergies with that. And again, learning. And then in the end of 2019, we decided it was time to launch our own I guess like straight out of the barbershop, we've learned everything here um, and we've found partners we could actually like build our products with. So we started doing that. But again, it was like dipping toe in the water to see, and it was sort of, what is the appetite for this? Not just within our walls anymore, but outside of it. Because we hadn't sold anything outside of our walls mm. in, in, from that first lot. That's we a big like, change, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it's yeah. different. And all like, can we get the packaging right? Because, yeah, you know, it's all very well when you got, you're cutting someone's hair and then you start it and they're like, wow, that looks amazing. It's like, it's one because I'm a great hairdresser and it's two because these are our products and you can, it's, it's, mm. it's, it's an easy upsell. Yeah. Because it's like, you can tell the story while yeah, you're there. And they know the brand yeah. and so they're already committed to it in some way. Yeah. Whereas if you're going into a retail environment and you're putting your products on the shelf next to other stuff yeah. Yeah. without any, you know, without a little head there telling you all the good stuff about it, mm. uh, it's a lot more challenging. So we, did that and we teamed up exclusively with Liberty, uh, with Bricks and Mortar and Cult Beauty uh, digitally. And so, I mean, that was great. I had a launch until through to the end of February with them. So we had like a three month exclusive with those two. And then, uh, and then obviously COVID struck in, in March. And we were like, of course. This is really annoying to live in <laughs> yeah. for us. So like, Got a warehouse full of stock. It, yeah. So it was a bit, um, yeah, that was a bit painful. And, you know, new brands getting newness onto a shelf of, you know, department stores, you know, there's, uh, agreements that we had were sort of fell by the wayside a bit. So, uh, and you know, we had to, as you can imagine, like cutting hair was a, was a, was an industry that was hit incredibly, yeah. incredibly hard. So, you know, we've sort of paused that product side a bit, to be honest. Yeah, let's just concentrate on consolidating and not making sure that we. Yeah. Say, I guess there's, there's um, you know, it's, it's a whole other 
world, isn't it? Let's say outside of the the stores themselves, that whole business of you know distribution and manufacture and getting products and sales and getting products into physical shops that must you know th yeah. that must take a lot of your time as well right uh yeah it, it it did and it was unknown to us right so you know it was a skill set that we didn't necessarily have mm. and so when we're like let's go do it you know it was a brave decision exciting and it's worked out all right and we've sort of had really positive feedback from it so that's given us confidence but right let's do it like our our proper range of it now. Yeah, so that so fragrances launched recently, Andrew. Yeah, so but there's there's one for each one for each store, and that was a bit of a lockdowny project. Was to it be honest? Yeah. So we we had such a sort of uh, a heartwarming response to being locked down. People were, like missed us, right? Mm. Because they didn't get everything we just talked about. That social interaction was yeah. lost. Um, that camaraderie, and so people were very kind. They were like, "Look, we miss you. We miss coming to you." And, like, and they, they, we get emails saying. You know, I used to come to Shoreditch and I'd stop off um, and get a coffee from like um, Fix 126, one, which is on the corner, this really <laughs> cool coffee shop. And then I come into you guys and get my hair cut and I'm missing yeah. this ritual. And so, you know, that community element of it, we decided, well, why don't we try and somehow take that fragrance, uh, t t take that pinpoint in that community in a fragrance for each shop. And so we got our store managers, each of them, whilst they're talking their thumbs at home uh, on furlough, we're like, well, why don't you guys come up with like what is your what does it mean to you speak to some, great idea. speak to some of your key customers cool. and then we briefed that and spoke we worked with Robert a brilliant yep. fragrance house yeah um, and they their perfumers were like yeah let's do this so we built these fragrances together and then launched them uh, towards the end of last year was there a lot of um, back and forth and testing and developing did it take quite a long time to get it to did the take final one it did take a long time so a couple of them a bit like all these things, sometimes they just hit the nail on the head. Mm. But what they would do is they would, you know, we'd brief them, they'd bring a couple of ideas and, and then you'd maybe tweak it a bit. But a couple of them, they were like, yeah, you know, just hit, like the Marvel one, for example, were like, oof, that just smells like you're in that sort of mahogany style tall house here. Just, yeah. you just got your, um, you know, coffee from Chilton Street and now you're wandering along with your monocle magazine type thing. It was like, <laughs> it was just like, wow, you, sort of, you sort of hit the nail on the head. But, you know, some of the other ones we tweaked a bit, uh, you know, uh, toing and fro with a few minutes. And we obviously, when we reopened, we were like, you know, get get them in here and to experience it. And also, because it's it's a very it's very social. So like, how can you put fragrance into? How do you put? How can you build a, a social fragrance? Because it was meant to be that community aspect of it. You can only do that by coming and getting your hair cut or having a beard tidy or a shave or whatever it is by one of our guys and just understanding it. And it sort of pulls all that together. And you know the history. So I mean. The Shoreditch shop was an old butcher's uh, back in the day, and you, when we stripped off the walls, you could see the old uh, you know, hanging rack where they had the uh, a really abattoir-style age the meat thing. thing. Yeah, where they'd be hanging their meat. So we're like, can you incorporate a little bit of blood in there? Right? <laughs> Some sort of uh, a pork. Yeah. So you know, we were sort of articulating that because we're not perfumers, but so you know, and it, you know, what happened was we found that you know when they launched it. You know, everyone and every, all our customers were like they were embracing whichever one their their store mm. was, and you know, there's a bit of wonderful competition between each of the stores as well to be like, hey, do you um, which which of you is going to have the the, the best selling best fragrance sell type of thing? And uh, you know, it's it was a, a fun thing to to do. Is you know, that's kind of the exploration of like ruffians and stuff. What we want to do, like we're not okay. we're not a fragrance brand. Like we, I don't, I, we never will be. Like who comes to a get their hair cut and think, oh, I now want to s smell like that. It's not a normal thing. Like, and so uh, when we then pitched it to Liberty and said, look, can we do exclusive there? We had a, like, a huge response there because people didn't... It was really weird. We thought, oh, God, who's going to buy this? But the, the packaging doesn't say anything about the barber shop. So when it went in their, in their beauty hall, uh, it went into their fragrance room and it was bizarrely the second best selling fragrance launch of the year for them was it it's so weird because we're not we're just not known but i think it's partly because the team there in the fragrance room they supported us and they were like the but roughly says right downstairs yeah. they sold the story and you know one of them was called soho so they were like they really embraced that and i think the other one that sold really well was edinburgh so actually our best seller yeah uh, and everyone's just like uh, yeah i want to want to snap that up and i think it was just refreshing to have something different but it's nice to also see that you know when you're not um, you know, where you're not pigeonholed as a barbershop or whatever, there is an opportunity for other people to be like, I like this brand. Yeah, I like, I like their, their vibe and their, their marketing. So those, um, like. that team in the, the fragrance hall at Liberty's are brilliant. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. In fact, I saw recently, I think, shout out to Stuart, but um, yeah, Stuart, one of the 
the guys who who works there, I think was doing he was doing a big old push on the, the ruffians fragrances yeah. on his on his socials. But um, yeah, they're really knowledgeable and a really you know they welcoming are. bunch. And that, I mean, Liberty's a great store because it's sort of got that reputation of you know finders like they they fought they yeah. You know, goes all back to Lazenby, Arthur Lazenby. You know, he went out to the forest and he brought stuff back that yeah. people hadn't seen before. And they, they really try hard you can in get there. some different stuff in there. Can't yeah, you? yeah. The buyers, like, they're always wanting to find the new thing. And yeah. then sort of that pulls in that crowd is just uh, of consumer who's sort of exploratory and aspirational. It's, yeah. Uh, it's a fun, yeah, it's a really fun place to be. But it, I think it's, um, you know, adding fragrance to the mix of ruffians, as, as you described so eloquently. I mean, it's such a, makes so much sense in terms of, reinforcing what you're doing and it can it can give a kind of um yeah it'll give a kind of halo effect can't it to the to the brand overall and then every time someone's spraying on the fragrance is another little reminder of yeah we talked about that in terms of like you know on the shelf like the ritual of coming to the barbershop well how can we recreate that a little bit for them at home so that Ooh. you know some people were like um we don't the fragrance of our shampoo the scent inside it we that's not one of these fragrances and, and a lot of the um the customer's like, why don't you have one like that? Because, you know, I enjoy coming here and getting my hair washed and stuff and then sitting back and having that lovely smell. Mm. And it's just so familiar to me and it takes me to a place of relaxation and confidence, yeah. which is what we're trying to achieve. So like, yeah. hey, he's like, but I, you, I can have that every day in my shower if you put it into the shampoo and stuff and uh, and, and the shower gels and things. And I was like, well, and then you can wear it as you go out on your fragrance. I was like, but that's not quite the point. Like, <laughs> yeah. what, what we're trying to do here, yeah. like, that's... For each function, you want everything. I don't think you necessarily want your shower gel to smell like the fragrance no. you wear, because no. I think, and you know, well, our, sh- our sort of shampoo, I suppose, is designed so that the fragrance should, you know, fall away within like ten minutes. Mm-hmm. Because you want a big shot of it, so you're in the shower and it's lathering up, and you're like, oh, this feels great, and then it goes away. Because when you, if you're wearing a, you know, products, uh, especially fragrance, you want it to smell of that right, rather mm-hmm. than it to be mm-hmm. sort of diluted with other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's where. That's, well, that's personally how I like it. So, yeah. like, that's how I want it to be done, I suppose. Well, look, I'm sure we'll um, we'll touch upon ruffians and the ruffians experience again a little bit later. But it would be great, as always, on the podcast, Andrew. I like to have a little nosier sort of yeah. a nosy around someone's bathroom shelf, as it were. So, are, are there some key products for you? Are you someone that's kind of loyal to certain? skincare and grooming and fragrance or, or do you sort of try different things so how about sort of skincare do you have a, a morning and evening routine i don't really not and not in the way that um you know a, a, a sort of skincare die hard would have I'm yeah quite exploratory so i have a lot of products as my wife tells me which is, is, is <laughs> semi-embarrassing like definitely more than more than her more than her yeah yeah but I, but why not but i'm not sure i i don't use that many like when i like something i probably become loyal to it uh, for a period of time, and then when it ends, like the tube ends or the tub, whatever it's in, try something else. Yeah, to be honest, I think I'd like to move on to other things. And if there's that, because you're trying to um, sort of trial different things for, for what might become sort of ruffians products, or just to sort of test the market, or are you just quite um, it start, inquisitive? It started that way. So I mean, pre ruffians, you know, my skin regime or my let's just say my morning routine, I suppose, was pretty basic. I'm actually like. It's still pretty basic, but I think that it's you don't need to go too far. I mean, mm-hmm. That's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, a good shower gel, and you know, I use simple shower gel, which I've used right. for the last you know thirty years. You know, I think since I was ten. Uh, you know, my mother used to use it, and it doesn't really smell of anything, but it functions really well. Yeah. And you know, it's never done anything. I, I think my skin must be so used to it that if I don't use it for a while or I go on holiday and I forgot on it like it also it just feels like a bit weird I don't know why yeah, yeah. so I'm quite a religious I get u- that. user of that and it's sort of cucumber extracts and stuff that it says uh, and then uh, shampoo I am actually not loyal to any shampoo it has to be said mm. uh, but I don't want to go back to roughness too much but the roughest conditioner is like an awesome product yeah so I use that I use that on me so I'd on be surprised if you didn't on my children everywhere like I just think it's it's so good and it leaves you you know detangles and I've got quite sort of curlyish hair so it's sort of uh, it's really good for me uh, and it's got seaweed extracts in it and like a lot of my life goes back to coastal waters and stuff I grew up on the coast and so 
a bit of a sucker for things like mineral sea salts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sort of the different types of seaweed which we put into the Ruffius products as well, because that stuff interests me, in, uh, as well as them being you know, awesome natural uh, ingredients. Facial moisturizer at this moment in time, I'm using the French brand called Horace. If you've heard yes, of I do know Horace, yeah. Do you know, so they're, yeah, I like them. So they've got some really cool stuff. Um, yeah. And like, I like, they've, they've got a, it's a sort of, it says it's a matte uh, sort of facial moisturizer, but actually mm. I find it's, it's not, when you see matte, you normally think it's something kind of hard and creamy. It's actually slightly oily, but which I think is nice because then it doesn't, so it matte gives us a sort of mattifying it. effect. But it's, it? Yeah, it's, yeah. And you can't really tell you it's on there, but when it goes in, it sort of absorbs. It's also nicely, so I use that, and I and then I don't use you know anything else on my face. I don't, mm. I don't use toners or anything like that. I just don't think I need to personally. Yep. Um, and then I use our hair cream, which is also like brilliant and got the seaweeds in, so for styling my hair, it's quite it's quite a battle to style my hair. I'd need like a fixer, like an aerosol, to actually tell it where to stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with his curls, so it will actually just do its own thing. So it's more like for your hair nutrition and like you know, keep the pollutions out, all that sort of stuff. That's why. I like using the hair cream. So, I mean, those are sort of my rudimentary yeah. things, I suppose. But and, and how about fragrance, Andrew? Do you, are you, are you, um, do you have a sort of range of fragrances or are you, are you using the ruffians ones? Or? Again, I'm totally... I use a lot of different... Promiscuous. Fra- yeah, I am a bit promiscuous. And it depends on my mood. And I, I like the idea of, um, you know, actually, when we did the ruffians fragrances, we probably, over the course of the, the projects... Oh gosh, I must have 20 or so different fragrances and some of which, you know, I've still got them in the bathroom and I will dip, and they've all got numbers next to them so I don't know what's in them. And so it's a case of like testing myself. Yeah. Um, so, and then I'll put them on and it's a way of just sort of, you know, I guess educating myself more like what's inside them, why, why it's like that and just the, emo- the emotion it gives you. So right. there, there are a, a few things. I mean, personally, out of the Ruffians range, it would be the Liberty one is that I love. Going back a few years as well, my favourite Fragrance probably of all time is Mont Blanc, like just the explore, which part? Explorer, Explorer yeah. yeah. But it might have been because I was more young and carefree in those days, and it's just it's it's just, I just associated it with a time in my life where I was just you know I didn't have kids, so I was I just yeah. met Kate, my wife, and we were having you know I was just I was living in central London and stuff, and really doing fun stuff, and it just took it everywhere with me, and it was it evokes a lot of emotions, and I don't wear it anymore. But they are like then whenever I come across it. I get nice very surprise. excited. Yeah. yeah. I'm just like, this is something. And, you know, for me, fragrance is is about emotion. It's yeah. about memory. Yeah. Totally. And, may, and maybe there's a little bit of, I don't know, if there's somewhere future as well. Like, so in terms of naming culture and stuff like that, we've obviously gone for just, we've called each fragrance for us, like where that store is looking mm-hmm. But I do like people like Dias and Dogo. I know you've had, yes. The, yeah, David, yeah, David was on. Yeah. So it's people with their naming, like Burrito, and that sort of more niche luxury market, I get quite excited, like smelling, like when you see a name and then lifting up the you know, pot, whatever they've got to smell it. But it's weird because sometimes it takes you to where you think that is. And other times I'm like, that is not what it should smell no. like. No, so it's just it's very subjective, it's, isn't it? It is, but that's why yeah. it's, it sort of makes it fun and exciting because yeah. you, you know, you're taking on a little journey and then in your head, you can be like, well, they've written down, this is the blurb of what I should be smelling. But then you get to create your own little world, and it doesn't mean you doesn't like the fragrance. It yeah. just means that you maybe don't agree with what their vision was. But yeah. I don't think those people would care. They'd be like, no. they, they. I think in fragrance it is so subjective. You can challenge it, and they'll be like, well, if that's what you feel, you know, yeah. great. You know, I think it's, it's yeah. If, if someone's created a fragrance based on a a certain place that was special to them or a certain holiday memory, it is quite difficult. It, I mean, let alone for the perfumer to interpret that. That's one step away. But for the End user, it could be, it could be anything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And you're, I, right, you're right. I mean, David, um, the, the descriptions that someone like the, the Dias and Durga Brown, I, I just think they're he, he's really good at creating this whole kind of world around the fragrance where there's a, a playlist and there's really interesting um, copy around it, and it just makes it kind of yeah, fun and, and irreverent. Yeah, and everything. Yeah, like, yeah it's, it's good. It's good stuff. Yeah, I, very I cool love it. brand. It's super cool. It makes me. Th- he's very cool. Terror of terrified. Yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. But that's all good. You know, one day maybe I'll be cool. <laughs> be waiting. It might no, children disagree, but I don't. Yeah, I felt very uncool with that. You know, sort of ex Brooklyn musician and you know turned. You've got you music in your bones, though, don't you? I do, I do, yeah, I do, I do actually, yeah, but um, not in kind of cool New York <laughs> indie. <laughs> I, 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 no, it's a story for another podcast, but uh, much more mainstream, actually. But no, he was he was great. Uh, just in terms of ruffians, it'd be it'd be really interesting to understand. Where do you see 
what do you see the developments in in with, with, with the brand and and you know where do you see sort of barbering going? Is is there uh, can you see developments in in the pipeline for, you know for the brand and 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 the sector as a whole? What what, what do you what do you think's happening at the moment? Yeah, I think that there's still you know the, our priority at this moment in time is going to be product building and like the so the, the sort of things that go alongside the actual barber experience to make that experience better. And as I said, taking it onto your own bathroom shelf, and mm. so that people can use Ruffian's products there, you know, and calling out some of the other products out there that probably aren't. I mean, we're so lucky; we've got this totally unique thing, like where we have, you know, one and a half thousand people getting their haircut a week mm. with us, and you know, the feedback mm. you can get from that, the expertise you can learn from it, yeah. is what we need to utilise and do better. And to so, do you think it'll extend to more sort of skincare? And I think so. Yeah. So skincare, and you know, we well, we need more support for that. So you know, we're actually we've got a new chairman uh, who's ex Neil's Yard Remedies. So he's coming on because, like, like I said, like when we launched, when we when we've done the fragrances, not just the fragrances, but any of the products, we haven't quite had the expertise that we need. We're all sort of putting our finger in the air and giving it a go, which is mm. awesome and fun, and we proved that it can work and that. Uh, it's it's so a for the business, for the product. which is why we've managed yeah. to attract someone like Andrew to come and join us and be like, hey, look, if with your expertise and like your background and your contacts, you know, let's actually do this properly rather than sort of, you know, to the customers who might have a sort of, like, oh, well, that, that product was good, but like, I want this, like, what, and why have you thought about that? Mm. That sort of knowledge that's being brought in, um, you know, is, is invaluable and it's not something, you know, it's, it's almost a bit like, you know, I should be sort of stepping aside in some way and letting someone else who's actually, it's, say it, this is the way it should be. So that's going to be exciting. In terms of barbershopping uh, themselves, I think it was, you know, a rough time for barbershops, you know, because of COVID and having, of having to be shut down. Yeah. And I think now you can see a resurgence and there's a, there's, there's a lot of optimism and there's a lot of, um, you know, a, a few tweaks that are happening as well. Like there are more smaller salons and, and barbershops probably popping up. People who were working for the bigger companies where there might have been 20 or so stylists or whatever, they're like, you know, well, that's not really the lifestyle I want now. There's a lot more flexibility around workspacing and they're like, I would like to be somewhere where there's four or five of us and maybe many working, there's a lot of chat about working less days. Um, right. So that they can have more of their life life balanced. Yeah, which I think is, you know, a nice, a nice environment that people are finding themselves getting into and, you know, a bit more personal. And, you know, in terms of the, you know, the high street, like the barbershop used to be, or is, such a key part of the, the high street and, yeah. and I think that's coming back as well because people, you know, there are a lot of places that didn't care enough closed mm. down in, in COVID times because they were like, they were just doing it because they had to and I think a lot of those guys have retrained and I don't know what they're doing like, but a lot of people went out of the industry, but, but they were in all honesty, they're not great ones in the industry who, who weren't passionate about what they're doing. Yeah. So the people who stayed are actually super enthusiastic, super hardworking and creative, and they want to you know, elevate this yeah. industry. And I, I think that a lot of the consumers who you know, couldn't have their hair cut for, and tried doing it themselves in lockdowns realized how valuable it's, the industry yeah. is. It's not easy, is it? No, so yeah. that, that's, that's sort of hard work. <laughs> I mean, for us, we'd like to do, we did a pop-up in New York, uh, in Soho. Oh, did you? And you know, doing more stuff like that, so synergies with different brands who are like-minded and you know spreading our wings a little bit is yeah. the, is probably our intention inter yeah. internationally if possible so they, it there you go spreading their wings um final thing andrew I, I like to ask each guest about as the name suggests is man in the mirror and um i wonder what what you think about when when you look in the mirror just in terms of what looks back at you and you know it, and, it, and i guess it could be appearance or I mean, where you're at at your life stage, and you know, what 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 do you think when you're doing your morning routine? That is a good question. I think I'm just really actually very happy at this moment in time with where I'm at. You know, That's so definitely lovely to hear. Definitely not in like the you know, <laughs> if we want to get personal about it, I'm not in the same physical shape and stuff I was when I was in my sort of twenties or thirties. Uh, you've you know, got young kids there, it's hard. That's exactly the reason, yeah. I totally blame them. <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of the aging process and the hair's getting greyer, so maybe it's time to work on some sort of cover-up, sort of wash shampoo that <laughs> can hide with these way. But I, I actually don't, that sort of stuff doesn't bother me, like, because I think you're looking at, you know, progress and, like, it's very easy to be like, oh, well, I'm not doing well for whatever reason, or I'm, you know, putting a lot of pressure on ourselves, but actually, take a step back and look at what you've got. And I am super privileged. I've got, you know, wonderful wife, three young kids, and we live, you know, most of the time over on the west coast of Scotland. So we have this just freedom and mm. space around us. And I'm I'm moved back to be nearer my family. So 
you know, we've got family, we've got those values that meant yeah. a lot to me and a community. So, you know, I'm in London now, but I'll be heading back up this weekend because we've got a big Kaylee and that'll be like 100, 120 people in the village hall with yeah. some bagpipes and some reeling and some fiddle. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a much slower pace of life. Yeah. But everyone's in there together. So there'll be my five year old kid dancing with his sort of 78 year old granny. Yeah. Like, and it, it's just, I don't know. I just, there's no need to, I've got everything I need, right? And yeah. then, you know, not to get cheesy about it, but you've, you know, we've got all proof over our heads. We, yeah. earn, we earn money, like, we, we, we're not on the breadline. And then you used to see people's worlds getting turned upside down now. Like, I can, you know, probably one of the great things is when you wake up in the morning and do your routine, like, it's a fresh day. There's no mistakes being made so far. And then I try as hard as possible not to look at the news for as long as possible. Because that, like, that brings me back, <laughs> back down. Back to reality. Back, back down to reality. But, yeah. you know, personally, you know, I could probably do a bit more exercise. I'd like to do a bit more stuff like that. But, but you know, I, I, I wonder also that, you know, you, you told me about, you know, where you live and, and it sounds so beautiful. And I wonder if that, you know, sort of appearance-wise, being living where you live, do you, do you, it's probably good for your skin and appearance. Like, you're, you're not, you know, you're not in yeah. urban sprawl I mean, all the time. I, I, you're out, out on the coast, aren't that, you? That's true. I mean, there is some weather-beaten faces <laughs> when, when they say, you know, the kids have a mixture of, like, rain on their face and tears coming down at the same time. That's probably... Not very, another walk down. Don't make me fall. for them, yeah. <laughs> as the salt water lashes their face. <laughs> but uh, I think that... You know, I, run, I mean, I'm lucky. I get the best of all worlds. So I get to be down here. Yeah. And I get to be up there because... You know, you are, it is calm up there, and like mm. you know, I'm not a makeup wearer, and I and I actually don't think I don't necessarily agree with it. I think just be who you are, mm. and like you know, eat well, enjoy yourselves, mm. do as much exercise as you can, so that you feel you know that's what makes you feel good ultimately. Otherwise, you're papering over the cracks. And I think you you know, as you said, when you're standing in the mirror, sort of you know, naked, you're just like, well, that's me, you know, yeah. and I'm and I'm pretty you've got to kind of reconcile yourself. Yeah, I'm pretty okay you. with that. Yeah. And then you come down here and it. You know, I got down the, the, the sleeper train normally, so I go to a, you know, get on the train in a, in a tiny little hamlet where it's in an unmanned station where you're sort of, it's dark in the west coast of Scotland, and then you come down here and you get off at Euston at sort of 8 a.m. and there's this hustle bustle. And I, and I just think, okay, game phase on a little bit, but mm. at the same time, it's exciting. You get that buzz of, yeah, of all these things happening around you. So I think it does feel like a nice. If you get that mix. Yeah, a nice mix, isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of, it can mess with your head a bit when you, if you, if, when you, you know, you come down, but it's just exciting. It's like it's a bit like being a kid again. Like, and I want to take the kids on the sleeper and put them down. I brought them down to watch Frozen the musical last year, and they were just like, like fairies with their heads. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> like buzzing. Like ever, 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 they were yeah. so good. But then they get back home and they just relaxed and were like, hey, yes, I'm home again. I'm like, don't you miss like you know the excitement? They're like, yeah, it was exciting, but like this is home and this is real. We got a dog and stuff, so it's just, you know, it's. I just oh, it feel sounds quite quite yeah. content in that in it that sense. Idyllic way where you are. I mean, I'm sure we're, someone that doesn't live on the Scottish coast can be guilty of kind of idealising it, but it does sound yeah. It does sound well, I mean, in, with with COVID and stuff, there's loads of people coming up there, camper vanning and stuff like that, and mm. you know, we were like a Airbnb practically, like for all <laughs> your for mates, our friends. Yeah, we're like one where we don't get paid. Though. <laughs> so uh, you know, everyone and they're like, this this is such a, a nice you know lifestyle yeah. to be in, and I think that goes a lot. I think when I was living down here, looking in the mirror, I felt like I was in the rat race a bit. Yeah, and, and I was yeah, there, that's like, interesting. Got to get to work, you know, and I was probably a bit more body conscious then, mm -hmm. like not necessarily just body, but like you know, just you just start, especially in my industry, you know, and the, the one time where it is like an absolute vocational hazard is Movember. Like, and I know the has yeah. died down a bit now, but we were right at the, you know, the front of it, the tip of the iceberg at the beginning, because it was it launched just before Ruffians, and then we were ambassadors with it the first few years, and we'd have like parties, yeah. And I was like, oh God, please don't let me grow a moustache. I'm a really <laughs> slow grower, so I'm not not, not like uh, you know blessed with. You yeah, haven't sorted by February. But yeah, I was a bit <laughs> like you know you meant to shave down on the first of December, uh, first of November. So I was like, I'm just gonna try and grow it and not let anyone see that I haven't shaved. <laughs> yeah, try and get my head started. And then one day I put boot polish on and Kate, my wife, went out. She was like, had a fit. She was like, oh my God, you look like some bomber pilot who, <laughs> who's, who's literally can't grow any hair. And it's just sort of stained their lip. It was those sort of things funny. But I mean, I, I don't take myself too seriously. So when I look in the mirror, you know, just see yourself and then just get on with it. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. And finally, Andrew, um, what is it that makes you happy, brings you joy? Mm. Family, community, I think that's the main mm. thing. I think having grown up in a really strong community where, like the Kaylee and everyone gets together, that means a lot to me. And, mm. you know, 
trying to help out and support those people. Like, so your, your family are, cl- are pretty close by then? So yeah, parents so they're, they're literally around a bay across a lock, you know. Lovely. You could do light signals. Can you? Yeah, towards one another so that you yeah. know, when the kids are up and saying, the grandparents, we can we know they're all right, the candles at yeah. the window type of thing. Three flashes <laughs> for uh, your still yeah. away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why is there bedroom lights? <laughs> no, uh, you know, I think that, that happiness to me is that, and, you know, that has hopefully really come through in ruffians because mm. it's like, you know, we call ourselves family the whole time, each other, because we're all looking out for each other. This is a tough industry. Like, you're on your feet yeah. for nine hours of the day chatting to 10 or 12 different people, mm. and it's emotional. And, and, and I think that, you know, having that support network, yeah. a drink at the end of the day or, you know, just giving, giving someone like a, you know, squeeze of the shoulder, yeah. it's a huge way. And yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I, I love it. Like, I love being with the guys and stuff. That's what's very special. And, and I suppose to retain the, those great staff that you have you know you, you you want to engender you want it to be feel like a nice place to come and yeah. work because otherwise you're going to lose all the good people that's it and i think that starts with like a happy culture at the top but yeah then it has to provide through the others and but what's great is they they make it happy because they'll do stuff for each other especially the managers and stuff they yeah. just look out for one another and they make it this sort of environment so we have you know ruffians parties and stuff like that so yeah. we're doing, we do like our own little awards and things at the head office archway and, uh, you know, it's just really good fun and everyone's there, you know, there's, there's competitive sort of banter and stuff like that, but yeah. ultimately... But that's you know, a lot you, about re- you're recruiting the right people, isn't it? And, and trying to keep them... And yeah. Yeah, I must say a lot about the, the culture of ruffians. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. And I hope that sort of community estimates, yeah. like, fills us through. Because, you know, if you've got a strong community, you know, you get a, com- you get a combined happiness rather than just, like, one person yeah. who's owning... The top guy who's doing yeah, okay. It's, it's like, yeah, look at you, you're... The, yeah, there's, yeah. there's resentment or whatever, but I don't yeah. think that, that happens. I think everyone's just like, you know, we're all looking out for one another. We've all got our own role to play. Yeah. You know, like, a, like we're, we're a team. So, yeah. that's that that gives me a lot of happiness. And family, you know, yeah. definitely. Yeah. That's all right, Andrew, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to um, come to the salon and, and, yeah, you can hear the kind of... the ambience of haircuts being done around us but um, it's been such a joy to spend some time with you thank oh, you so much yeah, and i appreciate you having me on oh it's my pleasure and um enjoy the kaylee this weekend <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> take care i was such an insightful chat with andrew um in in the salon in Marlborough, and there, there's so much there that i hadn't really thought about before and of course you know we all know that the the barber's chair can be a, a great place to you know to build up a rapport and and, and have a you know, sort of relationship with your with your barber, but you know, and and the the kind of conversations that can um, that could come out of that. But I hadn't really thought, you know, to my shame, I hadn't really thought about the 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 effect that that can have on the barber as well, and you know, the the sort of weight of the all those conversations and and those relationships, and that actually it can take a take a toll on the on the barber too. So it's re- really interesting to hear a bit more about that and in, and then in turn what what ruffians are, are doing for their staff to sort of make sure that they're they're looked after and uh, that there's a sort of duty of care but um yeah really great to, to see the store and see the, the products and and the treatments that are on offer via ruffians in london and edinburgh if you want to find out more about ruffians they're on instagram at ruffians which is r-u-f-f-i-a-n-s at ruffians and it's ruffians.co.uk online where you can see the products book treatments um, book a book a haircut and things like that so um yeah i recommend that you go and go and have a look at their product line and um if you're ever in either of those cities well worth visiting a, a ruffian salon um, if you want to find out more about Man in the Mirror, you can do. It's at Man in the Mirror Pod on Instagram. Um, you'll find details of the other episodes and more info about what's what's coming up as well. So I'd love you to follow along there. So look, my huge thanks to Andrew Cannon, such an interesting guest. Um, thanks to you for listening, of course. And I'll be back next time for more Man in the Mirror. Until then, take care. 